Well, hello, fellow weaver. I'm your host, Willow Goose, and today we're going to do a dramatic reading of the Shuttlecraft Guild Bulletin number one. Just so you know, this is Mary Atwater's newsletter, and it went out in September of 1924. And one of the things we'd like you to consider as you listen to this reading is how many of her thoughts actually still resonate to people today. It feels a little odd that nearly 100 years ago she wrote this, and yet all of her thoughts still apply to today's life. So just as an introduction, it says, Dear Guild members, it gives me great pleasure to greet you through the medium of our first bulletin. It is my hope that this monthly letter will serve to keep us all in closer touch with one another to the advantage of all. The next section is Value of Organization. And just so you know, we're not reading every sentence. We're only uh, giving you a little bit with some commentary in between. So value of organization. Keeping in touch is desirable for many reasons. Hand weaving is rapidly growing into a large industry in this country, but it is still almost entirely unorganized. Now, doesn't that still feel rather true today? I'm not sure if it's a rapidly growing uh, industry, but it is definitely um, an industry that is entirely unorganized. There has unfortunately been a good deal of professional jealousy among hand weavers, many of whom have actually tried to hold as a secret the bits of knowledge they have gained and have been quite unwilling to share what they knew with others. This seems to me not only the wrong spirit, but a very foolish policy. Now here again, I would say that while the way she phrased it is a lot more formal a hundred years ago, but she's actually quite uh, right in her observation. And I would say that we've seen many people who try to hold on to their knowledge, and then we get those who share their knowledge. Now, we can only theorize that those who hold on to their knowledge fear that if you took what they have, that they would have nothing. Okay, so if you imagine that they have a bucket full of knowledge and they keep it all to themselves, that bucket remains full but it cannot accept any more knowledge because the bucket is full. Now, if you consider that if somebody had a bucket, it was full of knowledge, but then they shared that knowledge, thus emptying the bucket periodically, that would allow for more space for new ideas, new knowledge. The bucket would refill that bucket would never be empty. Yes, some is leaving the bucket in the form of sharing. However, new ideas and new thoughts and techniques are coming into the bucket. So if you imagine that bucket, it may not be 100% full at all times, but it is never empty. And we geese think that that's the better way to think about things versus taking your now full bucket, holding on to it, and never letting go. So when Mary says that this seems to me not only the wrong spirit, but a very foolish policy, definitely agree. The next section, the economic problem. Hand weaving like any other art, is primarily a pleasure and only secondarily a means of livelihood or profitable occupation. Now, I think today many people would believe that hand weaving is definitely a pleasure. Um, 
it would be interesting to hear from people who actually make a living selling their hand weaving, whether they feel like it is primarily a pleasure and secondarily a means of livelihood or a professional occupation. Uh, sometimes we wonder whether the people who actually weave for a living do believe that it is a pleasure. Um, but hey, comment below and let us know. However, most of us like to make it pay. Profit is, after all, a means of success. And the burning question among hand weavers is how to do this, meaning how to make profit and uh, how to uh, gain that measure of success. And we would say that there are definitely people who believe that profit, while, you know, the goal is actually primarily a measure of success and secondarily the is the money aspect of it the hand weaver is on a small scale a manufacturer and faces the same economic problems as any other manufacturing concern three things must be considered one how to buy the best equipment and most suitable grade of raw materials at the lowest price Second, how to turn out the best possible product at the lowest cost for time and trouble. And three, how to sell the product at a profit. Definitely would agree with her. Those are the primary three things. And she furthermore goes on to explain each one. Item one, one of my chief aims in starting this guild was to find a solution for the first problem, meaning how to buy the best equipment and most suitable grade of raw materials at the lowest price. On another page will be found the plan for cooperative buying through which I hope to make it possible for guild members to buy materials in small quantities at wholesale prices. Oh my goodness, this woman was a pioneer here. Okay. If this service proves feasible, it may be possible to extend it much further than indicated in this newsletter. The second of the manufacturer's problems, how to make the best product with the least work and in the shortest time, is the subject matter of the course of instructions for which you have subscribed. For the time being, nothing further will be said on this phase of work. Okay, so that means that as we read future newsletters, we will find out how to make the best product with the least amount of work. And isn't that going to be exciting? We haven't read further. We are reading along with you. So there should be something good coming up. The selling problem appears to be for many weavers a naughty question. What a pun. They do not know what to sell, nor where to sell it, nor what price to demand. Selling is entirely a different business from manufacturing. Those of us who have had no experience in selling usually resent, as though they were unfair, the seller's percentage, both on the things we buy and the things we sell through a sales agency. Consider people selling on Etsy or uh, similar sites or in stores. That's what she's kind of talking about. The attitude of mind is, of course, entirely unreasonable. It takes time and trouble and the special talent of an uncommon order and usually a considerable investment for rent and fixtures in order to sell things. Okay, so now we can substitute, uh, you know, in many cases, if you're selling in the store, yes, there are rent and fixtures, but since most people sell online, we can uh, talk about web hosting, software environment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The seller's percent is just as legitimate a part of the price to the consumer as are the cost of raw materials and the time of the weaver. If we want hand-woven fabrics to be sold, we must make selling of such things sufficiently profitable to be interesting to the sellers. Definitely. Totally with her. Now, we will skip over some of the next 
parts and will tell you that you really should go to Mary's Guild site to see the original uh, scanned in text or you can buy your own copy on a thumb drive. Link will be available below. We're going to skip over the discussion of the sales venues, direct to consumer, which I assume is you, you develop a following of people and then you can just ask them if they want to buy your stuff. And we'll also uh, skip over the pricing to get to the best part of this newsletter. Standard of quality. The most important rule for oneself is the rule never under any circumstances to sell poor work. Poor hand-woven goods are not as good as machine-woven fabrics. They should not be sold even at a reduced price. They should never be produced and there is in fact no excuse for producing poor work. If a piece turns out badly through some accident, Find a home use of some sort for the thing if possible, or destroy it rather than sell it to someone, even though that someone may, in ignorance, be perfectly satisfied with it. This is the craftsman's honesty. The craftsman's pride is expressed through demanding a just price, and the craftsman's patience is required for making of any worthy thing. Now think about this. If everybody in our life had the craftsman's honesty, the craftsman's pride, and the craftsman's patience, wouldn't everything in life be so much better? We would have higher quality products, higher quality workers in our home. This would just be so fabulous. But I find her whole thought on this to be very uh, pie in the sky, but yet so worthy. So, so definitely, while we agree with her, not sure how realistic this is today. But, you know, if everybody lived their life by these standards, the world would definitely be a better place. I am anxious to make bulletins of greatest possible practical value to the circle and shall welcome suggestions or questions of general interest to be answered through the bulletin. I should also like to have an experience page. If you have found a shortcut or a new use for material or a new wrinkle of any sort, will you not share it with the rest? Hard luck stories are also not barred either. It is all interesting. Signed, Mary Atwater. Frankly, I think that, again, the writing style from a hundred years ago is quite interesting. I think you can feel the passion in her words, even though they are only written down. This is going to be an excellent read. And we hope that you will follow us as we go through and not only read a piece of paper, but add commentary and try to add some of our opinion to that. Hope everybody has a happy weaving day. Bye!